Okay, Psalm 92 this morning, Psalm 92. And uh, as this is uh, referred to as Palm Sunday on the Christian calendar, I'm going to preach to you a message this morning on the palm tree. I'm going to preach about a palm tree this morning, amen. Uh, Psalm 92, starting at verse number 12. Uh, it says here, the righteous, that's the same, shall flourish like the palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those that he planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall still bring forth fruit in old age. They shall be fat and flourishing. That's a good description of old age, isn't it? <laughs> to show that the Lord is upright. Uh, he is my rock and there is no unrighteousness in him. He said the purpose of... Uh, them bringing forth fruit there in verse 14 is that they might show the Lord is upright and he's our rock. Father in heaven, we pray that you'll bless uh, the reading of the word this morning and preaching from it. I pray, God, that you'd help us, Lord, today to, uh, uh, Lord, uh, find uh, uh, truth and comfort in what we're about to hear this morning from your word. I pray, God, the Holy Spirit would, uh, Father, uh, uh, take these truths and bring them home to our hearts. And help us to apply these things to our own lives so that it might glorify you, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, Psalm 92 there, verse number 12 is really the text this morning. And it said, the righteous shall flourish like the palm tree. So he says here that the righteous, they are like a palm tree. Uh, the righteous are the redeemed of the Lord. Uh, they're the saved, the born again children of God who have repented and renounced their self-righteousness and they received Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. And uh, Jesus Christ is our righteousness. Uh, it says there in that verse, the last verse, that in, in the Lord there is no unrighteousness in Him. Uh, and so we're in Him and we're righteous because we're in, sight, we're in Him. Uh, the righteous are Christians here who are in fellowship uh, with their Heavenly Father in the passage we're reading here. And the Bible here compares the Christian to a palm tree and says the Christian can flourish. That means he can thrive, he can prosper, increase, grow, and mature like a palm tree. But uh, people need to realize that just getting saved is only the beginning of the Christian life. Uh, you have to learn how to walk with the Lord and grow in grace after you become a Christian. Amen? Uh, too many Christians uh, have uh, become born again and accepted Christ as their Savior but they have not followed through in a lot of cases with their Christian life. Uh, there's many a person who's got a Bible sitting at home. They got When they received Christ as their Savior, their church gave a Bible, and it's been sitting there for years, and if you looked at it, you couldn't tell that they ever read it. Amen? Uh, they're not growing in grace. They're not getting in the book. Amen? They're not getting in church. They're not doing things they ought to. Many of them even come to church, and yet still they're not flourishing. They're not thriving. Uh, they're not really maturing in the Lord. And that's because they don't have a right relationship with their Heavenly Father if they're saved. Um, the way in which the uh, palm tree flourishes is the way that a Christian grows and matures in grace. So we're going to talk this more about how does the palm tree flourish and what does it do to grow and mature. Uh, they say that a palm tree loves to spread its roots by a river. It's got to be near water. Whether you see it above ground or below ground, there's got to be some water someplace because it spreads its roots by the river. And Christians flourish when uh, they're watered by the Word of God, amen? amen, in a place where the Spirit of God has got liberty to move and work in our hearts. Psalm 1 speaks of that. Uh, they also say that a palm tree grows only in pure soil. It won't flourish in dirty and gritty soil. Uh, we think of palm trees growing in the sand in Florida or in the, in the desert over in the Middle East and things like that. Uh, you take, uh, it can't grow in dirty and gritty soil. Uh, for a Christian, it means that a Christian can flourish if he's in a clean environment or she's in a clean environment. Uh, Christians can't flourish in an unholy and an unwholesome atmosphere. You're not going to flourish in that kind of an atmosphere. Uh, they say that a young palm tree is weak and feeble and it can barely stand up by itself. Uh, the Orientals usually plant three or four palm trees together to strengthen one another so they can stand fast. And the Bible says here in verse 13, it says this. He said, those that be planted in the house of the Lord, they're going to flourish. Well, 
Uh, you take uh, away that palm tree can't stand on its own. Uh, a newborn babe in Christ can't stand on its own. He needs some help, amen? And all of us as Christians need some help. Uh, we need to be able to join and clasp and grow together uh, as Christian people uh, to produce a strong, flourishing life for Jesus Christ. Again, young converts are babes in Christ. They need support to strengthen them and hold them up. And Christians need one another. Uh, thus, the importance of fellowship uh, with the brethren and with church attendance. Amen. Uh, Christians need to join together with fellow believers, embrace one another in gospel fellowship, and grow in grace together in the local church family. Uh, many people out there today looking for a church can't find a church. They might live in an area where they don't have any good churches to attend. Uh, but there are some that uh, are in places where there's churches they can attend. They go, they might not agree 100% on everything, uh, but they might agree on 90% or 85% or 95% or something. Uh, you ought to hook up with a local church where you can worship God and have fellowship with the brethren, amen? And that will help strengthen you as a believer. you got to remember that no church is perfect, no Christian is perfect, and you're not perfect, amen? And if you understand that, then it will be a lot easier on people. Uh, the local New Testament church is like an oasis in the wilderness. Uh, this old sinful world where Christians can come and grow together like palm trees by a stream in the desert. Amen. Uh, a Christian can flourish like a palm tree. He can bear the traits of a healthy palm tree if the previous conditions are met. So what are the traits of a healthy palm tree and a healthy Christian? Well, let me say this. A palm, I want to call it a palm tree Christian. This is the palm tree Christian message. Amen. The palm tree Christian. Uh, the palm tree Christian is, like a palm tree, upright. Amen? Upright. And speaking typically of the church, the Lord says in Song of Solomon that thy stature is like to a palm tree. That is, it's upright. It's straight. It, it, it stands straight. Amen? Uh, palm trees, they say, can grow up to 100 feet. They grow tall. Uh, they have no branches that grow out of the side of the tree. All the branches are in the crown, at the top, at the head, and they all grow upward towards heaven. Why? Because it's an upright tree, amen, and it's pointing to heaven. And you and I that are saved ought to be walking upright, standing up straight for Christ, amen, and our minds and hearts ought to be upward in heaven. Uh, the Lord said in Mark chapter 12, he said this, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. We're to love God with everything that we have, amen. And a palm tree Christian ought to be upright. His heart ought to be directed upwards towards God. Uh, Matthew chapter 6, Jesus said, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Amen. Our hearts ought to be on heaven. Paul said in the book of Colossians chapter 3, he said, if you then be risen with Christ, that if you're saved and you're born again, you're in the family of God, if you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sits on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above and not on things on the earth. Amen. Don't love this world, the things in it. You've got to set your affection in your heart upwards, amen, on things above where God dwells. Uh, the heart ought to be directed toward God. The mind ought to be directed upward towards God. Uh, the Bible tells us in the book of Romans, chapter 12, Be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. God says you need to be not conformed to this world, but transformed by the renewing of your mind. The only way you're going to change your ways and the only way you're going to be conformable to Jesus Christ is and unconformable to the world is to get in the Word of God. Amen. You're going to have to educate yourself in spiritual matters through the Word of God. Isaiah said this, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusted in thee. Uh, there's people running around today, they're not in perfect peace. They don't have peace in their soul, peace in their conscience. They don't have peace in their heart. Why is that? Because their minds are not on God. They're on everything else but the Lord. Amen. And the Lord says, if you'll uh, keep your mind on me, he said, I'll keep you in perfect peace. Amen. If you'll trust in me. Amen. And then uh, the palm tree Christian ought to also have his life directed upwards towards God. Uh, Paul said this. He said, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. He said, to me, 
He said, living is living for Christ. And so his life was directed towards God. Uh, the Apostle Paul was a man who persecuted the church of God. We know that. Uh, he, he tells his testimony in the Bible. Uh, the Bible tells us that he jailed, even killed Christians as part of his religious duty. And, uh, but later on, by the grace of God, he was saved by the very one that he fought against. After that, after that, he dedicated his life to serving Christ and preaching the faith that he once destroyed. He was, a, he, he was a changed man whose heart, his mind, and his life became directed upward, and his aim was to please God the rest of his life. That's what Paul did, and that's what we ought to do. Paul said, what you see me do, you do the same thing. We're to live like Paul did. We're to live with our hearts, minds, and lives directed upwards towards God. I read a story about a 2nd century Roman king who threatened a Christian who would not die his faith. And he threatened this Christian, if he wouldn't deny his faith, with banishment from the kingdom. And the Christian said, you cannot banish me from the kingdom of Christ. And I refuse to reject my Savior. He said, well, if he can't banish you, if that will work, he said, we're going to confiscate all your property. Take everything you've got. He said, well, my treasures are laid up in heaven. Amen? And then they said, well, if that won't work, then we'll execute you. And he said, 40 years ago, he said, I died to the world, and my life has been hid with Christ and God ever since. And the king concluded there was nothing that could threaten this man, and he said, what am I going to do with such a fanatic? His heart was already home, amen? His treasures were laid up in the beyond the blue, amen? His heart was in heaven. He was already there in his mind, amen? His spirit... He lived a life that was upright and directed towards God. And that's how we ought to live. Uh, secondly, let me say this. The palm tree Christian uh, is fruitful because the palm tree is fruitful. They say that the oriental palm tree um, is also called a date tree because of the fruit that it bears, which, of course, is sweet and pleasant to the taste. I'm sure you can get it at some store in town, amen, that sells organic stuff, amen. Um, but um, they say that Ancient travelers used to, uh, along these desert routes, would stop by there and they would pull the dates off the tree and they look at each other and say, huh, you can't eat just one. Amen. <laughs> They're that good. Um, hey, they, they, say the tree, they say that a palm tree produces its best fruit after 30 years. Wow. 30 years. Wow. You know, we're, we're, we're wanting to bear fruit right away, you know. Some people do. But maturity takes time. It takes time to mature in the Christian faith, amen? So if you haven't been saved 30 years, you have no reason to quit yet, amen? Because right. you haven't even got to the place where you're reaching any kind of maturity. You've got to wait and let God work in you. John, uh, uh, Jesus said this in the book of John chapter 15. He said, I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. Here is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples. He said, if you're going to be my disciple, you're going to bear much fruit. And the way you bear fruit is you're going to have to be abiding in me. You're going to be united and in union with me and in fellowship with me. Uh, the palm tree Christian is fruitful. Uh, what kind of fruits does the Christian bear? Well, he bears the fruit of salvation. Uh, John said, John the Baptist said, in the one place he said, bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance. I said, see, I want you, I want you, if you've repented, if you've believed, he said, I want to see some fruit. I want to see some fruit from your repentance. I want to see some evidence that you have repented and that you have been saved. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, if you're all familiar with that, it says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, what is he? He's a new creature. Every person in Christ is a new person in the Lord Jesus Christ. When you get saved, I believe some things change and they get re they, you get new stuff that you didn't have before. You know what you get? You get a new mind. You get a new heart. Uh, you start uh, exhibiting new behavior. Uh, you, you begin to have new desires. In other words, your mind changes, your heart changes, your behavior changes, your desires change when you get saved. Um, so there's the fruit of salvation. If you get saved, there ought to be evidence of the fact that you're saved. Uh, then there's the fruit of soul winning. Proverbs 11.30 says, The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that wins souls is wise. 
That is, uh, those who are wise are going to win people to the faith. Amen? Uh, they're going to win people to Christ. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to win them to Christ. That doesn't mean at any cost. We don't, you know, we, don't, uh, we don't compromise the Word of God to try to win them over to our side. We're not trying to win them to a political party. We're not trying to win them to our denomination. We're trying to win them to Jesus Christ. Amen? We're trying to get them to come to Christ and be saved. Um, there's a thing called the biogenesis principle. And that means that like produces like. Uh, we find that in the book of Genesis, chapter 1, where it says, Let the earth bring forth the fruit tree, yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself. In other words, that fruit tree is going to bear fruit of what it is. An apple tree is going to bear apples. Pear tree is going to bear pears. So on and so forth, right? What's a Christian going to bear? A, bear? a Christian ought to be reproducing other believers. Uh, whether you win somebody to Christ uh, and they become, they become a Christian for the first time or whether or not you're winning people over to just simply the truth and uh, uh, to be a faithful Christian, amen, and discipling them in the faith. So there's the fruit of salvation. There's the fruit of soul winning. And uh, healthy Christians ought to be producing and helping other Christians. Amen. Uh, then there's the fruit of the Spirit that a Christian ought to bear. Uh, the Bible tells us that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. That's in Galatians chapter 5. And then he says in that same chapter, he said that we ought to walk in the Spirit and we won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. If we're going to not fulfill the lust of the flesh, we're going to have to walk in the Spirit. Amen? So there's a law called replacement. That is the things that you enjoy doing that are worldly and secular and against God. Uh, you, you, just, you, you ought to quit those things. But when you quit those things, there's going to be a vacuum there that needs to be filled. Fill it with good things by walking in the Spirit. Amen? That's what he's saying there. Replace the old ways with the new ways. Amen? The fruit of the Spirit, you might call this. You might call it the God-developed character of Christian people. That's the fruit of the Spirit. It's the God-developed character that God produces within you who walk in the Spirit. Um, I believe that you can uh, probably categorize these uh, fruits of the Spirit three ways. One is inward, one is outward, and one is upward. For instance, love, joy, and peace is something you have on the inside of you. You can share those things. You can express those things. But you ought to have love in your heart. You ought to have joy in your soul. You ought to have a peace of mind, amen, if you're saved. And that's the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Um, one preacher I heard said this all the time. He said, everybody's looking for some love, some joy, and some peace, but they're looking in the wrong places. If you want some love, some joy, and some peace, you're only going to find it in Jesus Christ. Amen. That's the first three fruits of the Spirit. And they're on the inside of you. And God puts that in you when you get saved. Amen. Um, there's an outward, uh, uh, an outward category of these things. One is long-suffering. That's patience and perseverance. One is gentleness. That could be, I suppose, kindness. And then there's goodness. Those are things that are outward. That is, you ought to be long-suffering towards other people. You ought to be gentle towards other people. We ought to be good to other people. Amen. And then there's the upward aspect of these things. That's the last three. Faith, meekness, and temperance. That is, we ought to have faith in God. Meekness means we ought to have, we ought to be humble before God. And temperance means we need to have self-control to glorify the Lord. Amen? Uh, one uh, preacher said this. He said, the life and the greenness of the branches of a tree is an honor to the root by which they live. Spiritual greenness and fruitfulness in a believer is an honor to Jesus Christ who is his life. The fullness of Christ is manifested by the fruitfulness of the Christian. Uh, now these things that we're talking about, these fruits, are not the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Uh, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the first Corinthians chapter 12 and, and Romans chapter 12, they're different. But the fruit of the Spirit is something that you can't work it up. God implants it in you when you get saved. Amen? Uh, you can't fake the fruits of the Spirit. You can't do that. There's got to be love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance, and all those things will be a part of you. And you need to develop those things and let them mature in your life, amen, as a Christian. Um, 
The uh, Bible talks about the mystery of godliness in 1 Timothy 3.16. Uh, what is the mystery of godliness? Well, the Bible tells us there in that verse that it's God manifest in the flesh in Christ. That's the mystery of godliness. What is it? It's the fact that Jesus Christ came to this world and God dwelt in him. He was God manifest in the flesh. That's the mystery of godliness. And I believe this. I believe that Christ manifest himself also in the flesh through the life of the Christian. If Christ lives within us, he indwells us, the Bible says he does if we're saved, then we ought to let Jesus Christ live through us, amen, amen. by yielding to his spirit. And if we do that, the mystery of godliness is that Jesus Christ literally was in the flesh, but in some sense he's in the flesh through you and I. It's been said that Christ has no hands but your hands. Christ has no feet but yours, amen? Right. So if we're going to do anything for the Lord, if God's going to get anything done in the world, it'll be through believers. Amen? Who have yielded themselves to him. Uh, notice what Psalm 92 says again here in uh, verse number um, 13 about this uh, being fruitful. Uh, look at Psalm 92. Look what he says in verse number uh, uh, 12. Uh, verse 13. He said that uh, those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. I think that's talking about if you're planted... In the house of God. And the New Testament, the house of God is us, the temple of the Holy Spirit. What we do refer to the church as the house of God. In the sense that we meet here together as a congregation, as the body of Christ. And we do that to worship God and to fellowship with one another. Amen? And if you're going to flourish and you're going to be planted in a local church, you cannot flourish outside the church like you ought to. Amen? You're going to have a difficult time not being in the church. And uh, if there are some people, though, that they are difficult, amen? And they come to a church and they make life difficult for everybody else. I used to tell everybody that every Christian needs to be in church. I believe that's true. But I'll make some exceptions for some people, amen? There are some people that don't need to be in church. Because all they're going to do is mess things up, amen? Uh, if you can't get right while you're in church... Uh, at least keep your mouth shut and your attitude to yourself. Amen? And if you can't do that, then bye-bye. Amen? Go find another church, if you would. Amen? Uh, I can recommend you some. I've got some people I don't like, and I'll be glad to send you to them. Amen? Amen? But anyway, you get what I'm saying. And he says there that if you'll do that, you'll also, verse 14, you're going to bring forth fruit in old age. Old age, you're going to be flourishing. Fat means prosperous there in this passage here. You're going to be prosperous in the things of God. Uh, you're going to be flourishing as a Christian. And you'll be something that someone wants to behold and wants to see. Amen? I mean, there's some beautiful trees out there. You know what people like to do? If you see a beautiful tree, man, you want to see it. I remember one time uh, I had my tree um, in on the side of the house there. And it was uh, getting really out of hand. And I had this preacher friend of mine who did trees. And he came over and he cut the limbs and he... You know, he, he pared it back and all these things, and then he got off the a ladder and he came back and he looked. He said, look at that. You can see the glory of the tree now. And I said, you're right. <laughs> I can see the glory of that tree now. It's glorious looking, amen. And so the Lord wants to do that with us, amen. He wants us to flourish, amen, and uh, for us to be able to be uh, something that people would look at, and see and say, hey, there's a, there's a genuine Christian. That's what the Christian's all about, amen? And we want to have a good testimony for the Lord's sake to show, verse 15, that the Lord is upright, amen? And he's a good God. Uh, so let me go on here. Uh, thirdly, let me say this. A palm tree Christian, like the palm tree, is durable. Durable. Palm trees live a long time. And uh, they thrive under heavy pressures. When weighted down the most, uh, when weighted down the most it grows the highest. Um, it won't bow, it won't bend, and they don't grow crooked. Uh, the weight and the pressure make it grow taller and straighter. So pressure is a good thing, amen, for a Christian. Uh, the palm tree alone perseveres in the drought and the heat of the desert while the flowers die and the grass withers. But that palm tree is going to endure. Why? Because his roots are deep, amen, into the soil, and they are in contact with the water they need for nourishment. Uh, let me say this about Christians. We can endure here. 
We can thrive under the heavy burdens and the pressures of life. When we're weighted down by the cares of this life, we grow in stature, we increase in strength as we yield ourselves to the Lord. And just like a child may grow, you don't recognize how much they've grown until you don't see them for a couple of weeks or a couple of months. Then you see them like, wow, they've really grown. Right. You can't really see it happening before your eyes. But the grandparents, if they're not near, they'll see it. Friends will see it. Other people will see it. They'll say, wow, he's really sprouted since the last time I saw him. And they grow. And you and I are going to grow in the grace of God. We're going to grow in stature and increase in strength as Christian people. And maybe we won't notice it, but if you, you know, uh, take a look at yourself in a couple of years, you might look back and say, you know what? I have increased. I have flourished. I have matured more than I was a few years back. Amen. Amen. And you ought to be able to see that. And others will see it in you, even if you don't. Um, and, and again, we don't have to bow to the devil's demands or bend to the winds of the world or grow crooked with age. We can say true to our God, true to our church, true to our families, true to our friends, and we can be true to ourselves, amen, and we can live for Christ. We can endure here. Not only that, but as Christians, we will endure hereafter, amen. amen. We will endure hereafter. Uh, we that are saved have eternal life. We've got everlasting life. We're not just going to endure to the end of time, but we're going to endure throughout the endless ages, amen. We'll never perish. We'll live on and on and on and on. Amen. Forever and ever. In heaven with our God and our loved ones with the saints of all the ages. And it may be that, you know, one day uh, that we die and the rapture doesn't come. Uh, but when you're dead, you really won't be dead if you're a Christian. Amen. amen. Because you'll be alive in Jesus Christ and you'll be with the presence of the Lord. Amen. amen. If you've got saved loved ones, you know where they're at? They're in the presence of the Lord right now. Amen. That's where they're at. Um... And they're enduring. Uh, palm trees grow in the desert, and they survive. And sometimes we feel like we're in a desert, we're in a wilderness, amen, but guess what? If we're connected to Jesus Christ, if we're rooted and grounded in our faith, guess what? We can endure. A lot of people can't endure. You know why? Because they don't have their roots deep enough, amen, and they're not connected to Christ enough. Um, so the Christian can be durable. And all that, a palm tree Christian um, is stable and unchanging. Uh, the palm tree is an evergreen tree. That is, it's consistently green, it's consistently flourishing year in and year out, in season and out of season. Psalm 1 3 says about this particular tree, his leaf also shall not wither. So if you're planted by the rivers of water and you're uh, serving the Lord, guess what? Your leaf will not wither. It's not going to. Why? Because you are stable and unchanging in your position in Christ, and your practice ought to match up to that. Uh, too many Christians backslide and they revert back to their old ways. But the palm tree Christian is careful to hold fast the profession of his faith, and he maintains his Christian testimony in the summer of prosperity and the winter of adversity, so said Charles Spurgeon. Uh, the leaves of the tree draw their life from the root of the tree. And Jesus is the root of the Christian's life. He's the one who supplies us with all that's necessary for life as we abide in him. Amen. Uh, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Uh, he's consistent. He's faithful. He's stable. He's unchanging. And a stable, consistent Christian life comes from being in fellowship with the one who's always faithful. Amen. Which is Jesus Christ. So we can be stable and unchanging, amen? And the book of Proverbs, it, it, he says several times in the book of Proverbs, maybe Psalms, he'll say, this, he'll say this phrase. He said, I shall not be moved. I'm not going to be shaken. I'm not going to be toppled over. I'm not going to be pushed over. I'm not going to be pushed back. You know what? I am not moving. I shall not be moved. And that's what you can do as a Christian, Amen. Uh, and let me say this fifthly. The palm tree Christian has a smooth exterior. The trunk of the palm tree is smooth. You ever seen one? It's not rough. It's not knotty. It's not crooked. It's smooth. And um, it's not, but even though it's smooth and it's not rough and knotty and crooked looking, guess what? It's not weak. And it's not hypocritical either. It's tough, but it's not rough. You take a palm tree Christian, it's meek, but it's not weak. Amen? Hey, Christians ought not to be uh, you know, we're supposed to be humble. 
We're supposed to be lowly in mind and spirit and things like that. But that doesn't mean that we are a doormat to be walked over, amen? That doesn't mean we're a pushover, amen? It doesn't mean we have to give in everybody's demands for fear of hurting their feelings or something, amen? doesn't mean that. We can stand strong and true and stable and durable and unchanging, but we can still have a smooth exterior while we do it. Uh, through the years... Uh, you find that the grace of God in the life of a Christian will correct, straighten, and smooth out the rough surface of that old natural man. And he's doing that to conform us into the image of his own son, Jesus Christ. Amen. That's what he's doing that for. Uh, one preacher said this. He said, preaching is to knock off the dead limbs and knots and bumps that are on the rough, knotty, and crooked old church members. <laughs> Amen. And that's what preaching's for. That's why you need preaching. Amen. You need preaching to uh, to keep you right. Amen. I need preaching to keep me right. We all need that. Let me say this. Number six, the palm tree Christian has a servant's heart. Uh, the Hindus say that the palm tree has 360 uses. Um, they use the thatch for shelter, the fiber for weaving, timber for construction, leaves for clothing. I'm sure this is in the old days. Sap for drinking, uh, palm oil for cooking, and margarines, and soaps, and sweets, and candles, and greases, and things like that. Um, they say that uh, the palm tree serves as a shelter from the sun and the heat. It serves that way. Because why? It's a servant. God put that tree there in the desert so that you could find some shade when you needed it. Amen? Mm -hmm. And the palm tree shelters from the sun and the heat. The palm tree's fruit refreshes the weary traveler. Uh, your life ought to be one that refreshes other people. Other believers ought to be happy to see you. Amen. Um, the palm tree points the way to water. You know where palm trees grow? They grow near water. You know what's out, what's out, what, what, where water is out in the desert? It's in an oasis. It's called an oasis. Amen. An oasis. Water in the desert. Now, if there's no water there, I suppose it reaches down deep and gets the water from the streams that are flowing underneath the desert. Amen. But there's water there someplace. So if you find a palm tree, there's an oasis there. There's a little pond or something there. And if it's not there, just dig. And you'll find some water. Amen. So it's a, it's a thing that serves man out of the desert. And uh, many a person, I'm sure, their life has been saved because of a palm tree. Or maybe a group of them. Amen. I read the Bible. Wasn't there a place there where there were 70 palm trees? Near a, near, a, near a small pond or something. That's in the Old Testament someplace. I, I can't remember where it's at, but it's there. So you take the palm tree Christian. Uh, he or she is a servant of God. They serve the Lord. Their life is a ministry, and every day is an opportunity to do something for God and man. Amen? Amen. Every day is an opportunity to do that. And let me say finally, lastly, uh, the palm tree Christian is victorious. He's victorious. Um... The palm tree has a large, has large fan-like leaves. Uh, they're an emblem in the Bible of victory and rejoicing. Uh, the leaves are at the top, and they're called the crown, and it represents royalty. So palm leaves also represent subsequent awards in the military for previously earned decorations. So if you get a decoration for bravery or something that you did in the military and you do it again, they might give you an oak cluster or a palm leaf to put on there, which means you did it twice. Or if you got more, they'll add more. It has to do with being, it has to do with victory. It has to be recognized and recognizing victory. Uh, and so, again, the top is called the crown and it represents royalty, which explains why they took the palm leaves we read about in the Gospels uh, that day that Jesus Christ entered Jerusalem and they, they were accepting him and adoring him as the king and the son of David and the Messiah, the Bible said they strew palm leaves in front of him. And no doubt they were waving those. Leviticus chapter 23 talks about the Feast of Tabernacles. And it says there, you shall rejoice before the Lord your God. And they rejoiced because their needs had been met and because they've been delivered from Egypt. We can rejoice because God's delivered us from sin, death, damnation, and hell, amen, mm -hmm. and from this world system, and he's met our needs, and he'll continue to do so, amen. 
the Feast of Tabernacles, they built them temporary shelters there. No doubt they were built out of uh, so, sometimes maybe mostly even uh, uh, palm leaves could be the case. And uh, it was a thing of rejoicing. Uh, John chapter 12, uh, when they again, when they welcomed the king, that pictures the future coronation of Jesus Christ as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And as, like I said this morning, we may be shouting Hosanna to the son of David when he does that one day soon. And we'll certainly be shouting hallelujah, amen. The book of Revelation, look at chapter 7, look what it says here. Revelation chapter 7. Revelation chapter 7. And uh, if you get to Revelation chapter 7, I want you to look at uh, verse number, starting in verse number 9. Verse number 9. Revelation 7 verse 9. After this I beheld and lo a great multitude which no man can number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb clothed with white robes and guess what? Palms in their hands. Palm leaves. And cried with a loud voice saying, Salvation to our God uh, which sitteth upon the throne under the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts and fell before the throne their faces and worshipped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. One well, of these days we're going to worship God. Amen. And it says they had palm leaves in their hands. Right. It represents victory and rejoicing. Amen. And that's what it represents. And so... Uh, one of these days we are going to be in heaven uh, and we're going to be victorious, we're going to be rejoicing, and we're going to have a hallelujah time, amen? amen. And so get used to it, amen? Get used to it. Uh, what's that song we sang last week ago, try to learn from the first hallelujah to the last amen? Yeah. Okay, well get, get ready because we're going to be doing that when we get to heaven, amen? We're going to be, well, that one verse we read this morning talked about them rejoicing and the same verse said they shouted. So when you rejoice, you shout. When's the last time you went to the mailbox and pulled out a check that you weren't expecting or was more than you thought? I bet you let out a holler, amen. <laughs> I bet you weren't like, amen. You're probably like, amen. Praise God, amen. You weren't, it wasn't like you were in church, was it? Amen. Not at all. Let me say this. Um, you'll never wave the banner of victory in heaven until you raise the white flag of surrender here. Right. That is, you've got to be saved. You've got to submit yourself to Jesus Christ and accept Him and His righteousness instead of your own to get to heaven. And if you don't raise the white flag of surrender and give up your own righteousness and your own ways of salvation and trust in God, then you'll never, have, you'll never be able to wave that banner of victory one day. But if you want to join this crew here, and this number here, this multitude here, and have a hallelujah time forever, amen, you're going to have to give your heart to the Lord. Trust Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and receive Him into your heart by faith, amen? But that's the palm tree Christian. He's like a palm tree. And he says again in Psalm 92 there, which I, just, I think I just lost my place, but he says you're going to flourish. You're going to flourish if you'll plant yourself. You know where you're at right now? Wherever you're at right now, do this. Plant yourself, or that is bloom where you're planted, amen? Where's God, where's God got you planted? Bloom where you're at, amen? amen? Bloom where you're planted. And the longer that you have your roots in a place, the more difficult it is to transplant that from one place to another. You know why? Because you develop relationships. You, do, you have fellowship. Uh, you develop uh, uh, you know, ties with one another, family ties, friend ties, church ties, things like that. So you need to be careful when you make the move. But you make a move of all of any kind, amen? Uh, you, take a, you, you take your family moves away from you. That always hurts, amen? Always hurts. Uh, you may get over it after a while, but it's never the same. And the same thing's true with the Christian faith. Maybe, maybe you're not going to be in this church the rest of your life, but you're going to have to find a place if you go someplace else where you can be in church, amen? And you got there's a lot of people that have moved away and done things like that, and they haven't found a church yet. See what you need to do? Pray that God... And the reason is, a lot, of, a lot of people aren't looking, amen? A lot of people are not looking. So, part of our church covenant says there that if you leave this church, be sure and find another church of life, faith, and practice that you can be a part of, amen? 
part of that fellowship and a part of that uh, ministry. Amen. So don't retire on God. Don't quit on God at any time. What did I say? 30 years? Yeah. If you haven't been saved 30 years, it ain't time to quit yet. <laughs> amen. It's not time to quit yet. Now, so don't quit no matter where you are. Amen. Plant or plant. Bloom where you're planted. Amen. And if God wants to transplant you someplace, then he'll do it properly and do it right. Amen. Everything will be fine. But trust God in all that you do, and you will flourish in old age, even. And somebody said, this is an aging congregation. And it is, amen. We got a lot of old people in here. <laughs> I saw a lady the other day putting her groceries up at the store. I, I thought, I wanted to ask her, how is it, how are you doing being old? How is it? Are you flourishing? <laughs> are you prospering? Are you happy? Do you have the fruits of the Spirit or not? There's a lot of miserable old people out there. And there's some Christians out there that are old and miserable. And uh, that's why they need to go to heaven, amen? Uh, sometimes they just need to be released from this world and let go. And that would be the mercy of God in a lot of cases, amen? Uh, one preacher said this, one missionary said this. He said, Lord, don't let me outlive my usefulness. So when I become to the point where I'm not useful to God, Lord, just take me on home. That was his attitude, amen? So that's a good attitude to have, I think. But again, you're going to flourish in the middle age and young age or whatever, but you ought to start young and then keep growing, keep maturing as the years go by. And when you're an old person, guess what? David said this. He said, I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. He said that when he was, he said, I've been young, I've been old. I've never seen that. Why? If you live for God, guess God's going to take care of you, amen? Wherever you are, wherever you be, amen? So let's uh, trust the Lord. All right, let's stand for a word of prayer this morning. Father in heaven, we thank you once again for this day and for your blessings and for the opportunity, God, we have to be in church this morning and Father, to be able to teach the Word of God in Sunday school and preach it in the morning service. We thank you to be able to sing songs of praise to your name this morning and to worship you in spirit and truth. Uh, we pray, God, that you would bless the things that have been said and done this morning. May they strengthen, encourage, and help people, I pray. And God, for anybody, Lord, in the sound of uh, our voice this morning that's not saved, I pray, God, for them that, Lord, you would convict their heart. I pray, God, that they would surrender themselves to you, give up their righteousness, and, Lord, their good works that they're trusting to save them. And, Father, trust Jesus Christ and him alone for their salvation. I pray, God, now that you might bless the invitation. In Jesus' name, amen. With their heads bowed and their eyes closed while Brother Matt plays this morning. If you have anything you need to talk to God about, this altar is for you. I invite you to come use it. I encourage you to come and use it. If you've got something that God's really dealing with you about this morning, maybe God's dealing with you about something. Maybe God has uh, just uh, put a burden on your heart for somebody else that needs help. Pray for them. You can pray in your pew, but if God wants you at this altar, you ought to come on down here and pray as well. Let's just continue in a time of prayer for a short while here where you can talk to God. If God's dealing with you about something, then you deal with Him.
right, well, appreciate y'all coming out today. It was a good day. It's still a beautiful day out there. Good to see everybody here in church. Amen. This morning, glad you could be here. And uh, we'll be close. We'll, we'll dismiss in prayer now. And don't forget, next Sunday uh, we're having dinner uh, on the grounds next week. And try to invite somebody to come with you if you can. Uh, Brother Paul Hoyt, would you mind dismissing us in prayer, please, sir? Father God, thank you. For, we have a church here that places emphasis on your word, Lord, and we just pray that.